بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So the book that we're taking is Zad al-Mustaqni fi ikhtisar al-Muqni Zad al-Mustaqni fi ikhtisar al-Muqni It's a book which is authored by a famous Hanbali scholar Sharif al-Din uh, Sharif al-Din Abu Naja Musa ibn Ahmed al-Hajjawi al-Maqdisi Rahimullah Ta'ala He died in the year 960 Now Sharif al-Din Rahimullah Ta'ala He took this book as a summary from the famous work Al-Iqna' Al-Iqna' is written by the famous Imam Abu Muhammad Ibn Qudama Al-Maqdisi Rahimullah Ta'ala who needs no introduction Ibn Qudama Al-Maqdisi one of the greatest Imams of Ahlul Sunnah and one of the main uh, pillars of the Hanbali Madhab so he wrote a book Al-Iqna' which is like a second level book for the serious student of fiqh and Al-Hajjawi summarized this book so it's an ikhtisar. When the ulama, they speak about the ikhtisar, that a text is an ikhtisar, it's a summary, they mean by it two things. First and foremost, they mean that it's that text which is few in words, but many in meaning. So the words are summarized, the phrases are summarized, but the meanings derived therein are many. Okay? Some of the ulama, they said that the actual implicit uh, masail, the actual implicit issues in this text are 2,000 plus. Okay? Explicit, sorry. The implicit, the ones which are understood from the text, can be around 6,000 issues in this text. So though the text is small, the issues contained with it, where therein, which are studied, are so many. So the first meaning of ikhtisar is that, that which is few in word, but many in meaning. The second meaning of ikhtisar, which is appropriate to our uh, intention, the fuqaha, they say that ikhtisar is that text of fiqh which is written without evidences. So you'll find that it's this text, which is a very great text, and it's studied throughout the world, especially in places like Saudi Arabia, Palestine, and other places. It's an ikhtisad that doesn't have evidences. The evidences for this book, you find in the explanation of this book, or you find in separate books which are written specifically to give only evidences. And this is what you find in many of the madhahib. So the text is basically like a structure of what you should understand in your development of learning fiqh. It's a curriculum without the evidences, it's just giving the concepts. And that's what I would like you to take from this course. First and foremost, you have to understand the concepts of what we are discussing. If you can take how the ulama derived that concept with the evidences and the ta'lil, their reasoning, then that is well and good, that is something excellent. But if you are unable to do that because you cannot memorize, for example, or you are unable to retain the knowledge, then the most important thing we, to concern yourself with is understanding the concepts. Why? Why? What's so important about understanding the concept? Because that's what you're going to worship Allah Azawajal with, maybe. Right? So when you study a text in a gathering such as this, it's either for two reasons. Either one, it's on your path, it's your stairway to learning the higher texts, and it can also be coupled with the fact that you want to know how to worship Allah Azawajal. The reason I say this is because it doesn't have to be the case that whatever you take in the lesson from the Imams in the book, you have to worship Allah through that. No, it's not lazim, it's not obligatory that you do that, but it's better for you. Why? Because texts like this, you have hundreds of ulama that have explained them and given a lot of attention to these texts, right, throughout the centuries. So you basically are studying the culmination of a work which has taken place over centuries with thousands of scholars being involved in this uh, effort. So it's beneficial to take your religion in a particular manner, but it's not obligatory upon you. You can go away from the text if you wish to do so. You'll find that in this explanation, though my explanation is based upon the explanation of around five or six different scholars who explain this book, we're not going to go into too many details of difference of opinion. Because from my experience for myself, and also when I question you guys every time you come to class, when we do the review sessions, hardly anybody remembers what was said last week. So if we're finding it difficult to remember what was said in the text itself, how then can we add the second opinion and the third opinion with the evidences? We'll be totally lost, right? We don't have the ability to retain or to understand that type of information, most of us. So it's virtuous and it's imperative that we have a 
a clear goal, which is that we want to understand the text and we want to understand conceptually what the ulama mean. And if we can do so, we'll take the evidences for each uh, point that they have made. But we won't go into differences of opinions too much unless it's very important to do so. So first question to yourselves, what is the meaning of mukhtasar, of a summary? Yes, brother. Very good. It's concise, small in words, but vast in meaning. The second meaning? Excellent. The concepts without the evidences. The evidences you find in explanations or elsewhere. So here, Kitab al-Salah. The author, Al-Hajjawi, rahimullah ta'ala, he says, Kitab al-Salah. Kitab, what do we mean by the word Kitab? Those who study Kitab al-Tahara with me. The book of purification. When we say book, what does that have as a meaning for us? We know obviously it means book, but what does it mean linguistically? Chapter. Huh? Have one? Chapter. chapter? No. Chapter is bab. Kitab is kitab, book. So you have book, then you have chapters, and you have within the chapter, you have what is known as fusul sections. But I'm asking you, what is the meaning linguistically of kitab? Kitab comes from the meaning takattab. Okay, and it has the meaning like katiba, katiba to jaysh, means like the unit in the military, which is a gathering of a group of soldiers. So kitab takattab means to gather words and phrases around a particular subject, right? And salah, as we know, it's pertaining to prayer. But salah linguistically means dua. For example, in Surah Tawbah, وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ صَلَاتَكَ سَكَنٌ لَهُمْ And make salah of Muhammad وسلم, upon the believers, for very your salah is tranquility for them. So what does it mean here, salah in the verse? It means make dua for them, right? And also in Sahih Muslim, we have the hadith where the Prophet وسلم, said, إِذَا دُعِيَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيُجِبْ If one of you is invited to eat, then answer. فَإِنْ كَانَ صَائِمًا فَلْيُصَلِّي but if he is fasting, then let him make salah. But if he is not fasting, then let him eat. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if the person is fasting and he's been invited, then let him make salah. It doesn't mean you get up and you start praying. It means you make dua for the person who invited you. Right? So salah has the linguistic meaning of what? Dua. Right? I'm slightly deaf in this area today, so please raise your voices when you answer. Istilahan. This word, when I say istilahan, what does it mean, Muhammad? Technical meaning, ahsan. So when I say istilahan, we finish lughatan. I gave you the linguistic definition. Now I'm giving you the technical definition. Istilahan, what is salah? Salah, they say, at-ta'abudu lillahi ta'ala. Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At-ta'abudu lillahi ta'ala. Bi-aqwalin wa af'alin ma'lumatin. With words and statements which are well known. مُفْتَتَحَةٌ بِالتَّكْبِيرِ وَمُخْتَتَمَةٌ بِالتَّسْلِيمِ It opens with the takbir and it finishes with the taslim. Okay? This is the technical definition of the salah. طيب أَقْوَالٌ وَأَفْعَالٌ مَعْلُومًا مُفْتَتَحَةٌ بِالتَّكْبِيرِ وَمُخْتَتَمَةٌ بِالتَّسْلِيمِ So what is the rabbit? What is the connection between the linguistic meaning and the technical meaning? The rabbit, the connection between them is that the salah from its beginning to the end is dua, right? It's either dua al-mas'ala or it's dua al-ibadah. Dua al-mas'ala, this terminology dua al-mas'ala is that you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. In the salah, in the sujood or in the tashahud at the end, you are asking Allah azawajal for the goodness of this world and the goodness of the hereafter. Also, it's dua al-ibadah. So you have the salah, Dua al-mas'ala, which is calling upon Allah to ask him, and also is dua al-ibadah, the dua of worship. What do they mean by this? The scholars, they say that the act of worship itself is a dua. How? How is salah, the act of worship, or any act of worship that you do, a dua? When you read Quran, it's a dua. When you go to hajj, it's a dua. When you make the salah, it's a dua. Why? Because with this act of worship, lisan al-hal, it's as though your tongue is saying, oh Allah, forgive me and bring good to me through this act of worship, right? So that is dua al-ibadah. And dua al-mas'ala is the first one that I said when you're actually calling upon Allah. So the salah comprises both of these things. So from the beginning of it to the end of it is dua. That's why it has the connection between the linguistic meaning and the technical meaning. 
The salah, as we know, is well known and understood that it's mashru. It's something which is legislated. We find in the kitab, for example, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salah kanat ala al mu'minina kitab mawquta. That verily the prayers upon the believers are at prescribed times. You have to pray at prescribed times in Surah An Nisa. And also you have the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim where Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu said Bunya al-Islam wa ala khams shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah wa iqam al-salah wa ita'i al-zakah wa al-hajj wa sallam ramadan That Islam was built upon five pillars and then he mentioned the five pillars and from them he mentioned the salah. So this is something well understood by every believer that the salah is obligatory upon us through the Quran and through the sunnah. What does the author say? He says, Tajibu ala kulli Muslim. He said it's obligatory upon every Muslim. He said it's obligatory, that means it's wajib. But what type of wajib? Is it wajib like the other wajibat? No. The ulama, rahimahullah ta'ala, they said, this is awjib al wajibat ba'd al tawheed. It's the most stressed obligation after the obligation of tawheed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So pertaining to the rituals of Islam and the things that we are commanded to do, salah is from the most important of them. That's why if you think about it, when was the salah prescribed upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he was taken up to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The salah has that much importance. It's something that as we'll come to know that without it, you have no iman really and truly. The salah is the crux of your definition as being a believer. It's your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's your place of solace. It's your place of conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the closest that you can be to Allah azza wa jal. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فأكثر الدعاء The closest that you, are, uh, that you can ever be in relationship between you and Allah azza wa jal is when you are making sujood, so increase the dua. So it's a gift upon us. That whenever we want to be close to Allah we go into the salah. But we have to study how to worship Allah in this great act of worship. We have to take it extremely seriously. Seriously in knowing the fiqh pertaining to it. Seriously in knowing the spiritual aspects pertaining to it, which we will do. As we come to take the sifa of the salah, the description of the salah, we will go through each word, understanding what each word means and what it means to us spiritually. How we can through these words come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his permission subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's something which is extremely important. So the author, he said, Tajibu ala kulli Muslim. Every Muslim has to make salah. And then he said, Mukallaf. So first you have to be Muslim and then you have to be Mukallaf. Mukallaf means that when you reach this state, when you reach this description of being Mukallaf, now you have to respond to the obligations that Allah has put upon you. So how do you become Mukallaf? There's two things that need to be there for you to be in this state. The first of them is Balugh. You have to be Balugh. The second of them is you have to have aql. You have to have your intellectual faculties with you, right? So if one of these is missing, then the obligation is not upon you to pray or to do any of the acts of worship. The Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith in Tirmidhi narrated by Ali radiyallahu anhu, rufi'a al-qalam an thalath that the pen of responsibility has been lifted from three. And in na'im hatta yastayqid, from the one who is sleeping until he wakes up. Wa an sabi and from the young person until he becomes uh, until he reaches the age of puberty. And from the one who has lost his faculties of thinking until he regains those, right? So we said that the person has to have aql and the person has to have balugh. Why does the person have to have aql and balugh for him to be mukallaf? Because without this, you cannot make the intention. The intention is not valid. If the person is a child, his intention for obligatory actions is not valid. If the person doesn't have the faculties of mind, presence of mind, they cannot make the intentions in the first place. The intention, right? So this is why the ulama, they put this as a condition. Also, I said to you that the person has to be baligh, reach balugh. How do we determine has a person reached balugh or not? How do we know a person is now baligh or not? Yeah, pubic hair. Wet dream. Menstruation for the woman. 
and the age of 15. So whichever one of these comes first, then that's how you determine that you are balik, okay? Or a person is balik. Uh, the pubic hairs they show, a wet dream is experienced, uh, the age of 15 is reached, and for the women, we add that they experience menstruation. Any one of these, then the person is balik. So the person has to be Muslim, mukallaf, right? Then the, per the imam, the author, he makes an istithna. Istithna, this Arabic word, means exception from the ruling. He says, إِلَّا حَائِضْ وَنُفَسَا إِلَّا حَائِضًا وَنُفَسَا Sometimes you will find that even though Brother Salman, he puts so much effort into the work, there is no work made by a human being except that it has mistakes. So my reading, use it as a way to correct any mistakes which are in your text, okay? In terms of the tashkil, if you want to do so. إِلَّا حَائِضًا وَنُفَسَا So in Bukhari and Muslim, we have the narration of Mu'adha bint Abdullah al adwiya where she said, I asked Aisha radiyallahu anha, um, um mu'minin our mother. She said, ma balul ha'id taqti sawm wa la taqti salah. She said, Aisha, why is it that the menstruating woman, she makes up the fasting, but she doesn't make up the prayer? So Aisha radiyallahu anha said to her, a hururiyatun anti, are you from that group of deviated people from hururiyah? Um, who are known as the Khawarij, she said, no, let's to be Hururiyati. No, I'm not from them. Walakini asal. Rather, I'm just asking. So Aisha radiyallahu anha said, kana yusibuna thalik wa nu'maru bi qada'i sawm wa la nu'maru bi qada'i salah. That used to happen to us, meaning we would menstruate, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would command us to make up the fasts, but not make up the prayer. So the hadith in Bukhari Muslim is a clear indication that the one who's ha'id, or the one who's nufasa, the one who is postnatal, has postnatal bleeding, is not obligatory upon them to pray. Therefore, they do not have to make it up if they miss it due to menstruation or postnatal bleeding. The Imam, the author, Al Hajjawi, rahimullah ta'ala, he said, وَيَقْضِي مَنْ زَالَ أَقْلُهُ بِنَوْمٍ أَوْ إِغْمَاءٍ أَوْ سُكْرٍ أَوْ نَحْوِهِ a person makes qada of the salah. He has to make up the prayer if he misses it due to losing his faculty, his mental faculty, through sleep or through ighma, which is being unconscious, or through being sukr, which is drunk, okay, being affected by alcohol, or something similar to that. The Prophet said in Bukhari and Muslim, إِذَا نَسِيَ أَحَدُكُمَ الصَّلَاةِ أَوْ نَامَ أَنْهَا فَكَفَارَتُهَا أَنْ يُصَلِّهَا إِذَا ذَكَرَهَا the Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you forgets the prayer, right, or he sleeps until the prayer is gone, then the expiation for that is to pray the prayer as soon as he remembers it. So as soon as you remember that you've forgotten a prayer, or as soon as you get up from sleep that you didn't intend to go beyond the time of prayer, then you have to pray, okay? You have to make qadha. So here's a proof in the hadith that you have to make qadha. And the other issues about ighma, about losing your uh, mental faculties, or about becoming drunk, qiyas is made upon the one mentioned in the hadith who is sleeping, right? Because the hadith mentioned the one who forgets or the one who is sleeping. So qiyas in the other situations is made, qiyas meaning, how do we translate qiyas? I always forget this one. Huh? Analogy, right? Deductive analogy, something to that effect, right? So qiyas is made. So the intoxicated person, the one who's drunk, has to make up the prayer. But when does he make up the prayer? Huh? Well, I'm not sure after 40 days. But no, not after 40 days. His prayer is not accepted for 40 days, right? In terms of ajr. But he has to make the prayer up as soon as somebody said? As soon as he's sober. And do not come close to the salah, Allah says, until you know what you are saying. The one who is unconscious, he also has to make up the salah, as we mentioned, because Abdul Razak in his Musannaf and Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf also mention about uh, the Sahabi, Ammar ibn Yasir, that he was unconscious for three days continually. And as soon as he got up, he called for wudu and he made up those salah that he was unconscious for. Tayyip? Another qawl, another opinion in the madhab is that the bughma alay, that the one who is unconscious doesn't have to make up the salah that he passed. If he gets up and there's time for him to pray the present prayer, that is the prayer that he has to pray. Okay, this is another qawl in the madhab. What you'll find in the madhab of Imam Ahmed, you will find that there are many riwayat. 
riwayat meaning narrations and this has a variety of reasons from them is that the taqwa of imam ahmed that when he would come across more certain knowledge than he used to have he would change his opinion right so he gave a previous fatwa then he finds that actually new knowledge that he's come across now is better than what he had previously so he would change the fatwa or the circumstance by which he gave that fatwa in changes therefore the fatwa changes but in any case in any case you find that the riwayat the narrations from imam ahmed can be quite uh, numerous but as sheikh abdul salam as shawair hafizahullah ta'ala one of the leading scholars in the hanbali madhab today in his explanation of this text zad al-mustaqni he said the riwayat are four different types he said the first of them is nas nas meaning it's a statement directly from imam ahmed himself pertaining to a fatwa the second of them he said is wajh wajhun when you hear that riwayat al-wajh it means that the ulama of the madhab the the, um, the ones who are at the level of making ijtihad very high level of scholarship they based upon the asul of imam ahmed based upon the fundamentals of imam, of imam ahmed reached a conclusion or a fatwa so that this fatwa because it was based upon the fundamentals the asul of imam ahmed is described to imam ahmed the third of these riwayat is what is known as ima ima is that a statement was given of imam ahmed but not clear pertaining to an issue so what the scholars the mujtahideen understood from that statement a fatwa is given according to it and then ascribed back to imam ahmed and the fourth of them is takhrij takhrij is qiyas shubha that imam ahmed gives a fatwa on a particular topic and then another situation arises which is very similar to that so the fatwa is given for the new situation and again is ascribed back to imam ahmed so you'll find that at times i say to you there's another riwayah it doesn't always mean that Imam Ahmed had more than two or three opinions. In fact, Sheikh Abdul Hassan al shawair in his explanation, he said most of the time, it means one of these four things, not the fact that Imam Ahmed himself said it, but it's taken as part of being part of the madhab. What does the Imam say next? The author, he says next, وَلَا تَسِحُّ مِنْ majnoon, As we said already. And it's not, um, the salah is not valid from a person who has lost his, mental faculty why why he cannot make the intention wala kafir and not is it accepted or obligatory upon a kafir in surah al-anfal allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says qul lil ladina kafaru in yantahu yughfal lahum ma qad salaf say to those who disbelieve if they stop their disbelief and become muslim then that of their previous sins will be forgiven so where is the proof in this verse that I quoted to you that salah is not obligatory upon a kafir? Where is the istimbat? Where is the wajh dalala How do we understand the evidence to show that the kafir, salah is not obligatory upon him? Good. So they went order to pray, they were ordered to stop their disbelief. But there's something more than this. So the verse said that you will be forgiven your previous sins, right? So if salah was obligatory upon them, right? Then it would go against this ayah, which, would, which means that they would have to make up the salah. But the ayah is saying that anything you did before is going to be overlooked, meaning that salah was not obligatory upon them. This is how some of the ulama, they explained the ta'lil. However, the kafir who is saying, the disbeliever, that salah is not obligatory upon him, nor does he have to make up any salahs when he becomes a Muslim. The exception here is the one who was murtad, the one who made ridda. Ridda is that somebody who makes apostasy from the religion. May Allah protect us, Amin, from that evil deed. So if somebody was a murtad, right? They were Muslim, then they left Islam and they come back to being a Muslim. If this person had prayers that they didn't pray before they had left Islam, then those prayers would have to be made up not the ones that he missed during his state of disbelief the ones that he didn't do whilst he was a muslim right so whilst he was a muslim there were some prayers he missed out then he left islam then he comes back to islam after making tawbah so those which he didn't do whilst being a muslim he has to make up that's the exception as mentioned by sheikh abdul salam al-shawair so this kafir disbeliever if he prays then he is a Muslim 
Hukman. Hukman means in terms of ruling, mean outwardly. Outwardly, we would treat him as a Muslim, but inwardly, it's between him and Allah. Is he truly a Muslim or not? Here, you need to concentrate just a little bit. فَإِنْ صَلَّى فَمُسْلِمًا حُكْمًا طيب. The Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari al-Muslim said, مَنْ شَهِدَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Whoever gives testimony that there is none to be worshipped in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَاسْتَقْبَلَ قِبْلَتَنَا And faces our qibla وَصَلَّ صَلَاتَنَا And prays our prayer وَأَكَلَ ذَبِيحَتَنَا And eats the food that we sacrifice فَإِنَّهُ مُسْلِمْ Then verily this person is a Muslim لَهُ مَا لِلْمُسْلِمْ For him, in terms of rights, is that which is for the other Muslims. وَعَلَيْهِ مَا عَلَى الْمُسْلِمْ Upon him, in terms of obligations, is that which is upon other Muslims. So this person now becomes a Muslim by praying. How does this make any sense? So somebody, he didn't say, أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The Hanbali scholars, they say that a Muslim, a, a person can become a Muslim by two ways. The first way is that they say, express, they say the testimony of faith, right? The second way is that they do an act of worship which contains the testimony of faith, like the adhan or the salah. So when this person, he comes and he says, you know what, I just want to try out the salah. I don't really want to become a Muslim, I just want to try the salah. And of course we're talking about in an Islamic uh, situation where there's Islamic governance, right? So he says, I just want to try the salah and he starts to pray. After he's prayed, we say to him, now you're Muslim, khalas. Now you're taking the rulings of Muslim. You cannot leave the religion. Right? Otherwise the ahkam of riddah would be upon you. And also if the person after praying he dies, he has the rights of a Muslim. We bury him in the Muslim graveyard, etc. After giving him a ghusl. Why? Because he said the testimony of faith through the act of prayer or through the adhan. However, this Muslim, this one who became a Muslim hukman, it would be said to him, the prayer that you just prayed, repeat it. Why would it be said to him, repeat the prayer? Because he didn't pray as a Muslim. He became Muslim through the prayer, right? But the prayer wasn't there due to intention, etc. as a Muslim. So it would be said to him, repeat the prayer. And if he says, no, no, I don't want to be Muslim, then we say, okay, now you have to be dealt with, right? So probably he will still be a Muslim. That's only in the context of Islamic governance. Tayyip, um, the author, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says, وَيُؤْمَرُوا بِهَا صَغِيرٌ لِسَبْعٍ And... A child is commanded with the salah at the age of seven. In Abi Dawood and Ahmed, we have the hadith of Amr ibn Shu'ayb, where the Prophet sallallahu said, Murru abna'akum bisalah li sab'in. Command your children to pray at the age of seven. Wadribuhum alayha li ashri. And um, discipline them physically at the age of ten if they refuse to pray. وَفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَهُمْ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ And when they reach the age of 10, then do not allow them to share one bed with one covering. Okay? Separate between them. So the point in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, command them at the age of 7 and discipline them physically if you need to do so. But obviously not in a physical manner that will hurt them at the age of 10. So this shows you a very important point. It shows you that from an early age, we have to instill the salah in the souls of our loved ones. Don't be that person who when your child reaches the age of 23 and now he's leaning towards atheism, you start to complain to the Imam of the Masjid. What can I do? Is there a particular ruqya that I can do for him? No. This question gets asked so many times. You didn't take care of your jewel, of this gem that you had in your life, this beautiful gift that was given to you from an early age. From an early age, we need to instill in ourselves, in the children, the love of the salah. You know, this world is a battleground of ideas. People have this idea today that leave, don't pressure people, leave them, let, they find, let them find their own way. What do you mean, let them find their own way? Let them find their own way to a burning fire? We know the fire is real. We know what's coming. We have to be serious with our children and our families and ourselves. We know they're going to be upset with us. You know when you tell a fat man go to the gym, the fat man's screaming and crying. He doesn't want to go to the gym. He hates it. That's the nature of the child or the adult when you tell him to stop praying and start having tawheed. His soul is screaming, no way. But the more you keep saying it, the more you keep rewarding them, the more you keep saying it with gentleness, the more you keep making dua, the more you keep forcing them, eventually they will get the taste of the halawat al-iman, of the sweetness of faith. And that applies to us also. 
Sometimes we stand for prayer and we're just not enjoying it. It's because too many sins. It's because we're too far from Allah. But if we keep pushing our fat soul towards Allah, it gets healthier, thinner and healthier until it starts to enjoy it and becomes addicted to the salah. So like the Prophet ﷺ said, command your children from an early age. Then the author, he says, As we mentioned, the, person is, uh, the child is reprimanded physically, if need be, but not in a hurtful manner, at the age of 10. فَإِنْ بَلَغَ فِي أَثْنَائِهَا أَوْ بَعْدَهَا فِي وَقْتِهَا أَعَادٍ The author, rahimahullah, he says that when this child is praying the prayer and if it happens that he reaches this point of balugh in the prayer, which is very rare because how are you going to know that you reach balugh in the prayer, right? You're going to check your armpits all of a sudden. It's very rare that this would happen. But what's more likely is what he said أَوْ بَعْدَهَا Or after the prayer it's realized that the person has now become balik with so he's prayed, but the time for prayer still exists. There's still enough time to repeat that prayer. Fi waqtiha a'ad. Then the person is told that now you have to repeat. Why? Because the prayer that he did whilst a child was a nafil in his book of deeds. It wasn't an obligation. Why? It wasn't a fard salah or wajib salah. Why? Because he didn't have the intention. Okay? Or he wasn't at the age of bulugh. I should say. So in this situation, if the person uh, reaches balugh after he's done the prayer and there's enough time to repeat the salah within its time, then he's commanded to repeat the salah. Another statement in the madhab, another qawl mentioned by Ibn Taymiyyah, is that the person doesn't have to repeat the salah because he did wadhifat al waqt. He did what was upon him in that time, even though it was enough of salah for him. What was upon him in that age and in that time, he did it. So there's no need or there's no allowance for us to ask him to do it again a second time. That's a second statement or a second opinion in the madhab. The Imam, he says, Rahimullah ta'ala, wa yahrumu ta'akhiruha al waqtiha. Guys, remember, right, before you come to this class, you have to take a good shot of coffee. Right? Make sure you take a good shot of coffee before you come. Wa yahrumu ta'akhiruha al waqtiha. And also remember the huge rewards that you're getting for talab al ilm Do both. Read about the rewards before you come and get yourself some coffee in your system so you can concentrate. So the Imam, he says, it's not allowed to delay the salah beyond its time. Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitab al as we read before. That very the prayer is designated for the believers at fixed times. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Woe to those believers who delay their prayers or who are careless with regards to their prayers, right? So we have to be very particular about how we pray our salah. So he said, it's not allowed to delay it beyond its time. What does he mean by delaying beyond its time? He means here, beyond what is known, waqtul ikhtiyar. Because the salah has two times. Salat al-Asr and Salat al-Isha have waqtul ikhtiyar and waqtul durura. All, all of the other salahs is one time. Waqtul ikhtiyar is the preferred time or what is known as the chosen time. Before you have the time of durura, the time of necessity. And that's this is for Salat al-Asr and Salat al-Isha. We'll come to know this further in the chapter where we speak about the timings of the salah. So when the author is referring here that do not delay beyond the salah, do not delay beyond the time, he means waqtul ikhtiyar. Then he says, an istithna, he makes another istithna, an exception to the ruling. He says, illa linawin al jam, illa linawin al jam, except for the one who intends to combine. This person can delay. Who are the ones who intend to combine? Give me an example. Huh? Musafir, yes. Traveller, who else? Due to a necessity, who else? Yeah, basically necessity, that covers many of them, the sick, the one who's menstruating, etc, etc. And then the traveller, right? So these people, they are allowed to delay. Imam al-Buhuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the leading scholars of the madhab, of the mu'akhirin, the latest scholars of the madhab, he said, look, the reality of the, this mas'ala is that the person is not delaying his, his salah when he joins the two prayers. Because when you pray Salat al-Dhuhr in the time of Salat al-Asr, that is your actual time, right? As long as you made the intention before Salat al-Dhuhr passed. So he said, you're not delaying the salah. But he said, this was mentioned by Imam al-Hajawi to show that it's permissible to do so. And to tell the people that the person, if you see him doing it, they know that he's not doing something which is har haram. But the reality of the mas'ala is that he's not delaying. Okay, he's praying, he's just joining the salah to another. 
So this person is an exception, right? The one who's going to join the salawat. Also, he says, وَلِمُشْتَغِلٍ بِشَرْطِهَا الَّذِي يُحَصِّلُهُ قَرِيبًا And also for the one who is busy and occupied by trying to fulfill one of the conditions of the prayer, which is able to be done soon. So also an exception for the one who can delay the prayer is somebody who's busy trying to fulfill a condition of the prayer if it can be done soon. This is the translation of what the Imam is saying. What does he mean here? Somebody, for example, needs to make wudu, right? The person needs to make wudu, but water is not available with him at the moment. So when he goes to go and seek water, he has to drag it out, he has to fix first the rope to the bucket, he has to get to the well, send it down and pull it back up. This may take him half an hour. And by the time he gets it and makes wudu, the time of salah has now gone. According to the author's statement, then this is permissible, this is allowed, because the person was busy trying to fulfill a condition of the salah. Sheikh Abdul Salam al shawair in his explanation, he said, it said that the first who ever came with this statement in the Hanbali Madhab was Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqdasi, <coughs> Rahimullah Ta'ala, the first of them that ever came. And he said, Sheikh Abdul Salam says, it's a very problematic statement, because he said it's known by ijma that what does the person do if he doesn't have water? He makes tayammam, right? In order to pray on time. Tayammam is there in order to protect that the salah is given, is performed in time. So it goes completely against what this statement of the author is saying. Shir Sheikh Abdul Salam al in his explanation, he said the way this is to be understood, and this is the reality of what Imam Ibn Qudama meant, is that this applies to somebody whose wajib is fil akhir al waqt whose wajib is in the, la- in the last part meaning somebody for example was asleep he gets up from his sleep and he only has like 10 minutes left to pray 10 minutes is left but he needs to go and do the issue with the wudu he needs to go and find water and water he knows is close this is the person who this ruling applies to that it's his wajib came in the end time because he was asleep for example right or for the one who menstruation finished and now she has to make ghusl and it's in the end time. So by the time this person makes wudu or ghusl, then the salah is going to be over. Then this is the person that this statement applies to, right? So this is the technical understanding of this statement. And also like the Imam, he said, uh, if the condition is going to be gained in a close proximity of time. The reason he put that there is because he's not saying to us on his understanding of this statement that you can delay your salah however long it's going to take you to fulfill your condition. Because that would mean, for example, if we say that, going to now find water may, may take three hours. So you've come to the end time of Dhuhr, you end up missing Asr, and now it's time for Maghrib. So he's not saying that. Hajjawi is saying that you can delay it if it's close in proximity, that you can fulfill that condition. But like we said, Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawair, he said the reality of this text and this understanding and what Ibn Qadama meant, according to him and other scholars, uh, al-Shawair is saying this, Abdul Salam al-Shawair, is that the meaning of this meant in this statement is that it only applies to the one whose wajib came upon him in the end time. Like the one who got up was he, uh, from sleep and he only had like 10 minutes left of uh, prayer time. So by the time he got his wudu, the time had passed. So for this person, He can pray after the time has passed. But everybody else, they have to pray within the time. Even if you had a thobe which was najis, you had a thobe which was impure, and by the time you can wash your thobe and dry it, the salah is going to finish. We say no, you still have to pray within the time, even if your thobe is impure. Taib? I will try to keep it simple in future, inshallah, but there are a few points where I need to expand the poem. The Imam, he says, وَمَنْ جَحَدَ وُجُوبَهَا كَفَرْ and whoever, whoever refuses to accept its obligation, the obligation of the prayer, then he becomes kafir, right? Whoever refuses to accept the obligation of the prayer becomes kafir. Why? Because this is a matter, This is a matter which is known from the religion as being an obligation by necessity. Unless the person lived in a jungle by himself, right? So anybody who has access to Islam, he will know or she will know that the salah is something which is obligatory upon them and therefore if they deny that obligation they fall into kufr 
and this ijma upon this. Likewise, somebody becomes a kafir also if they leave the prayer, if they stop praying out of laziness or what or carelessness, right? In Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةِ فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ To kufar, if they make tawbah, and they establish their prayer, and they give the zakah, they will be your brothers in the religion. So when are they accepted as brothers in the religion? By first establishing the salah after tawbah. So the salah, if it's not there, according to the ayah, there's no iman. Right? And also, the Prophet sallallahu said, as in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Jabir, Radiallahu anhu, he said, the Prophet sallallahu said, Bayna shirk wal kufr wa tarku salah, bayna shirk, bayna rajlu wa shirk wal kufr, tarku salah. Between a man and falling into shirk and kufr is the leaving off of the salah. Okay? As narrated by Jabir. In Abi Dawood and Tirmidhi and Ahmad and others, we have the hadith of Buraida, where the Prophet sallallahu said, Al ahad, alladhi baynana wa baynahum as salah, faman tarakaha, faqad kafar. That the agreement which differentiates us and the non-Muslims is the prayer. We agree with Allah to pray. So whoever leaves it, then he has left Islam. You see now how serious Islam is, how serious Islam is about Salah. Salah is a serious matter. And also we have, uh, we have the statement collected by Imam Tirmidhi and authenticated by Imam Nawi in the Khulasat al-Ahkam of the leader from the leaders of the Tabi'een, Tabi'een meaning the students of the Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Shaqiq. He said, Kana ashab Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yarawna ma kana ashab Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yarawna shay'an min al-a'amal tarkuhu kufr ghayru salah. That the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an ijma' as a consensus, they wouldn't look upon any action, leaving it off leads you to kufr except salah. So there's a consensus amongst the companions collected by Imam Tirmidhi and mentioned by this great Imam, Abdullah ibn Shaqiq. So it's something which is very serious. But I'll add a few explanatory notes to this at the end, inshallah. So the Imam is saying, and the Hanbali scholars, they say that the one who leaves the salah is kafir, right? Whether you leave it out of juhud, that you reject its obligation, or you leave it due to laziness or carelessness. So he says, وَدَاعَهُ إِمَامٌ أَوْ نَائِبُهُ فَأَصَرُ But in order for the ruling of kufr to be put upon this person, the authority has to deal with the case of this person. So the imam of the Muslims, or his na'ib, the one who he puts in charge of dealing with such cases, like a judge or anybody else, a minister, would call this person. So a person has been known in the community not to pray. So this person's case is taken to the authority. So the person is brought before the authority, right? فَأَصَرْ وَضَاقَ الْوَقْتُ الثَّانِيَ أَنْهَا So the person is told to pray. And if he doesn't pray until the second prayer expires, then the ruling is given upon him, not before. So the person is told to pray. And if he doesn't pray even after being told and a second salah expires its time, then the ruling is given. Why do we have to wait for the second salah? We mentioned it previously in just passing. Joining. Somebody said joining. Ahsantun. Joining, right? He might be from those who can join the salawat. So that's why we have to wait for the second salah to pass. Right? And also in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said in the Sahih, سَيَكُونُ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَرَاءُ يُؤَخِرُونَ صَلَاءَ الْوَقْتِهَا There will come to you a time when your leaders will be from those who delayed the salah from its prescribed time. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, what do you command us to do? He said, Sallu a salah li waqtiha, thumma sallu ma'ahum. He said, pray the, time, uh, the prayer in its prescribed time, and then pray again with them. So the hadith is showing that the one who leaves off the salah, one salah, is not uh, declared as a, a disbeliever. So this is also a proof that it has to be more than one salah before the person is given this ruling. وَلَا يُقْتَلُوا حَتَّى يُسْتَتَابُوا ثَلَاثًا فِيهَا and the person is not executed in an Islamic governance until he is brought and imprisoned for three days. When he's imprisoned, the person is very gently begging him, look, please pray. This is something that Allah has obligated upon you. Look upon the benefits. And by the way, here's a beautiful meal. Have this meal while you're being imprisoned. 
The third day, second day comes. The third day comes. After all of this, if he doesn't pray, then he's executed. Can you see any logic behind why he would still be executed? Imagine now a sword over your head for three days, telling you pray, pray. Speaking to you so nicely, but the sword is waved in front of you. If you don't pray, you're going to get this. What man with even an atom's weight of iman would say, no, I'm not going to pray, I prefer the sword. True? So nobody in their right mind would say, no, I'm not going to pray, I prefer the sword, unless they are a deeply rooted kufr in their heart. So that's why the person would be executed. Ibn Taymiyyah, as an important statement, he said, in his opinion, and the majority in fact, that these rulings are for the one who la yusalli bil kulliyya, who doesn't pray at all. Right? He just doesn't pray. Not one who prays here and there. Okay? So Ibn Taymiyyah, his opinion about what we mentioned was that it pertains to the one who doesn't pray at all. We'll stop here, inshallah. And anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. If the sisters have any questions, they can put